You have to be tough as a damn boot to be good. Because you have to stand your ground when you need to stand your ground. And you have to be able to say no when it's time to say no. And you have to mean it. And so then you have to think and plan strategically so that when you're going to say no, you can mean it and it will stick. You know, and that takes a certain amount of, that takes a certain amount of integrated malevolence, I would say. And, and once it's integrated, it's not malevolence, it's strength. It's, it's strength of character. It's the ability to stand your ground. And you have to cultivate that. And you cultivate that at least in part by telling the truth. And so you take your place in the world as a decent person and as a decent citizen. And then and you play the hierarchical game properly. And that is to stand up straight with your shoulders back. It's like the world's an onslaught. You've got the tyranny of culture to deal with. You've got the catastrophe of nature. You've got your own damn malevolence and ignorance, right? All coming at you, plus the incredible, complicated, indeterminate potential of the future. That's all coming at you, and it's all your responsibility. And you can cringe away from it and be afraid of it and be victimized by it and be bitter and cynical about it. And, and no wonder, because it can be painful. Or you can turn around and you can say, man, bring it on because there's more to me than there is to the catastrophe. And this is what I discovered from looking at what I looked at. I looked at the darkest things I could look at, look, really, for 30 years. I was really a lot of fun to be around, I can tell you. I looked at the darkest things that I could think of, right? Not only what happened in Auschwitz and what happened in the Gulag, but, but personal issues, you know? It's like I wasn't so much interested in the totalitarians as a group. I was interested in the people who undertook the terrible acts that the totalitarians required. You know, the people who, I was just rereading Ordinary Men, and it was a story about a police battalion in Poland that trained ordinary policemen to take naked pregnant women out into the fields and, sh and, and, and shoot them in the back of the head. It takes a lot of training, by the way, before you can bring yourself to do that. And you aren't the same person by the end of it. It's pretty goddamn horrific. You know, and I was trying to figure out what would it be like to be that person? Because we are that person. And then what would it be like to not be that person, right? To refuse to do that, to not participate in that. You know, and, and what I discovered by making that totalitarian proclivity personal was that there was, there's more to us than there is to the horror as nature is, bent on our destruction, bad as culture is, tyrannical and bloody, back as far as you can look, as malevolent as you are in, in the darkest part of your heart, and that's plenty malevolent, the, the, the possibility that's within you that can well up the, the courage and the truth and the ability and the skill and, and, the, and the willingness to set things right, if you are willing to set them right, is more powerful than all of that. And so it's so interesting. It was, it was proof for me of an old saying I, I read from Carl Jung. It's an alchemical motif in Sterquilinus Inventor, which is what you most want to be found will be found where you least want to look, essentially. And it's so interesting because it means that if you're willing to turn around and to stand up, say, and stand up straight and face the darkness like fully, what you discover at the darkest part is the brightest light and that's something that's so much worth discovering because there's going to be terrible darkness in your life and it's going to make you cynical and bitter and it could easily be that you're just not looking at it enough because if you looked at it enough and you didn't shy away and you brought everything you had to bear on it you'd find that there was more to you than there was to the horror I have people writing to me from all over the world who are saying they're doing that. They're saying, well, you know, I cleaned up my room and, and then I stopped saying stupid things and oh my God, it's like, things are way better. It's like, who would have guessed it, you know? And so it's low hanging fruit, man. Because that's the other thing. If there's a lot of things wrong with you, then it's, it's really easy to start fixing it, you know? You've got so much, there's so much territory that you can inhabit. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. That's good. I mean, the whole nation thing, that's positive. But to have God on your side, that's, you know, you might want that. When things get rough, that would be good. And make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Wonderful. That's a good deal.
And I will bless them that bless thee. That's good too. And curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's something. That's something. Wouldn't it be something if you could wake up and your day was composed in part of people thanking you for all the good things you've done in the world? Wouldn't that be good? It's not impossible for that to happen. So Abram departed. <laughs> yes. As the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years when he departed out of Haran. That's old. Now Abraham lives a long time, but this is also part of the story. So he has a wife who can't have children. He has nothing. Obviously, he's been hanging around dad's shack for a little too long, given that he's 75, right? It's time, it's time to get a fire lit underneath him a bit. And so it, he's not got much going for him, but he still decides to, to move forward. And I've seen this too, you know, like... If you don't have your destiny in hand by your th time you're 30, it's, it's rough. You start hurting. And if you don't have your destiny in hand by the time you're 40, then you really start hurting. And 40 is a real fork in the road. The fork in the road, that's always where you meet the devil, by the way. And that's because every time you have to make a decision, the possibility of evil beckons. That's why that is. I had a friend, I've told you a little about him, and he killed himself just after 40. You know, he had had a book published with a very small press. He was quite a good writer, but he could not get himself together, and it hit him too hard at 40. And I'm not saying that it's hopeless at 40. I'm not saying that. And, and, and I'm not saying that partly because of these verses, but also partly because of what I've seen in my clinical practice. I've had people come to me who have had very chaotic and ill-spent lives, let's say, who were in that neighborhood of age and and it's true for people who are older as well who then decided to make a real effort and to try to make where they were better you know instead of being bitter about where they weren't because that's the bitterness that really does you in it's really not good it's the opposite of gratitude it's 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 the manifestation of resentment it makes you malevolent it's very very bad to be bitter it's not it's not it's hell to be bitter and if you're 40 and you're not successful, then you have to accept your lot and you have to start to improve what's right in front of you. And if you do that, it doesn't take very long. It's quite interesting to watch people. Things can be a lot better in six months and they can be way better in two years. Like, it's a struggle, uphill struggle, but it's by no means impossible. And, and I don't know, again, what the limit of that is. I suppose it depends to, degree, to some degree on the degree of your commitment. But anyway, so Abraham, it's another indication of the the real validity of this story. God isn't setting this up to be easy, right? Abraham's old, and, he, and, and, his, and his wife is old too, and more than that, she's barren. How is he going to be the father of nations? How is he going to be successful? Well, the initial departure point is insufficient, radically insufficient. And, and that's very inspiring because it means that you can start from where you are. worth asking yourself. It's like, drop what you're doing that's foolish, that you know is foolish, and pick an aim that's worthwhile, you know, to make things better for yourself, like you're worth taking care of, like you're worth something, you know, and to surround yourself with people who, who believe the same, and who are what rejoicing in your accomplishments and unhappy when you fail, right? And you're comparing yourself to your accomplishments of yesterday and not to someone else's today so that you're not jealous and bitter. And you put your own house in order so that you're not cursing the world when some of its disarray might be your fault. And you're trying to pursue something meaningful and you're doing your best to tell the truth and all of that. And then you see what happens. Who the hell are you? You know, you think you're a miracle of some bloody bizarre sort. We've been around for three and a half billion years. You know, every single one of your relatives propagated successfully. And here you are, against all possible odds, in this, in this world of hell in some sense, and, 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 and bitterness, and, 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 and tyranny, and malevolence. And yet, God only knows what's inside you, this capacity for consciousness, the capacity to confront potential, and to turn it into something good. That's us, man. 
That's the Western story. That's the individual as the cornerstone of the state. That's our responsibility. And it really is who we are.